1944 war the North many chiefs had suffered economically when customs duties were levied on ships calling at the Bay of Islands, raising the cost of goods and reducing the flow of trade. They were further disadvantaged in 1841 with the relocation of the colonial capital to Auckland. The new governor, Robert Fitzroy, 1844-45, waived crown preemption, the crown's exclusive right of land purchase, partly to appease Heek and other northern chiefs who wanted no constraint on whom they could deal with. Heek was incensed that the Union Jack, a symbol of British government, flew over Corica, the town now called Russell, without the former New Zealand standard of 1834 beside it. As a result, he had the flagpole chopped down four times in 1844 to 1845. Some considered this a truly patriotic gesture on Heek's part. On the last occasion, the township of Kororika was sacked and pillaged, and most buildings, except the church buildings, were burned. The townsfolk were evacuated to Auckland. Fighting between British troops, aided by some Mori such as Neen, and the forces under Heek and Kaidi broke out, and on 15 January 1845 a proclamation was issued in both languages offering a reward for Heek's arrest. Fitzroy was recalled, to be replaced at the end of 1845 by the military governor George Gray. Maori fortifications and tactics enabled the forces under Heek and Kaidi to defeat the British troops, and when they gave Governor Gray an empty victory at Ruapeka Pika by simply withdrawing, the tactic led to stalemate. 1846 surplus land taken in 1846, the British government issued a self-governing charter to the colony, and instructed that all Maori land ownership be registered. Any lands deemed to be unused, were to become crown land. The preemption clause in Article 2 of the treaty requiring Maori, to sell only to the Crown or its agent, was reinstated by Governor Gray after being waived two years earlier by his predecessor, Fitzroy. Crown preemption meant exclusive right of purchase, not first option. Crown agents developed a range of frequently dubious practices to persuade Mori to sell, and the Crown monopoly meant that they could offer whatever the government was prepared to pay, not a market rate. Governor Gray embarked on wholesale land purchases in the South Island, the Wairarapa and Hawke's Bay. As complaints increased, the government itself was the arbiter as well as the defendant. Mori criticized a system that did not allow them to lease out their own land or receive market prices, while many Pka wished to purchase directly. 1852 First New Zealand Parliament excludes Mori the Constitution Act 1852, which set up New Zealand's parliamentary system, suggested some form of temporary local self-government for Mori. Section 71 provided that native districts could be declared wherein the laws customs and usages of the aboriginal or native inhabitants should for the present be maintained for the government of themselves in all their relations to and dealings with each other. Gray did not, however, declare any native districts, arguing that the amalgamation of races was proceeding well through trade and through the mission schools. In the administration of justice, Gray did provide for the appointment of chiefs as salaried Mori assessors and police, to assist the resident magistrates, and in practice, the joint administration did allow for a measure of practical recognition of Mori values and customs. However, since the right to vote was based on individual property ownership, Mori who possessed their land communally were almost entirely excluded from voting for parliament. Amalgamation with settler society was still believed to be the only future for a race thought otherwise to be doomed. But in many important respects, notably in the national parliament, and in the provincial assemblies which were also established at this time, Mori were not included in the new governing institutions. Well aware of the settlers' hunger for land, they became increasingly anxious for their future. 1858 First M. Mori King in the first year, that the Pge population exceeded that of Mori in New Zealand, the first Mori King was chosen. A decade previously this concept had been suggested then, in 1854, Gadi Ruenui hosted the first of many joint talks among North Island Mori to halt the advance of Paka settlement, and stem the decay heirs of Q traditional Mori society. 
Now a unified warrior response was believed possible in the movement, soon to be called Kinjitanga. The AGO but very high-ranking Wikado chief Tiwero Ero, who had not signio the treaty, became the first king, taking the name Padadao. Around him grew the Kinjite movement, supported by Maori from Oraki to Oroenua. The Kinjitanga was not universally welcomed among Mori, though, with many chiefs refusing to pu air mana under that of someone else. The northern tribes of Tai Takarau Natko involvement, because they were strongly associated with the treaty, which was viewed by some as being in opposition to the King movement. They and others reacted against the Romli Tainui tribal connections of the Kinjitanga's leadership. It should be neo that the Kinjitanga regarded the queen as complementary to the Mori king, not as a competitor, but the Colonia government took a different view. Under the second king, Tayao, who ruled for 34 years from 1860, the movement gave strong erection and cohesion in many of the armed campaigns that followed. 1860 war and Taranaki warfare directly linked to land issues broke and Taranaki in March 1860. The government, wishing to show its freedom to act, insisted on dealing with a minor chief over a small diacat Watara against the direct opposition of a senior chief, Waremu Kingi, Ano Mo's of the local people who were actually living on the block. Those Mori who resisted the alienation of their land, were immediately branded as being in rebellion against the authority of the crown, in defiance of Article 1 of the treaty which provided for Ni Queen S. Savaregni. The new Plymouth military commander sent troops to enforce Thai purchase, and the land dispute became open warfare lasting a year. Many more came to Taranaki to fight alongside Waremu King in defense of his land, and many others throughout the country were sympathetic to his stand. 1860 Koham Kamarama Covenant Governor Thomas Gore Brown, Governor 1855-61 convened the first of many large meetings on the treaty, partly in an attempt to draw attention away from the King movement and the fighting. It should also be noted, that the idea of the treaty as a holy covenant between Mori and the Crown had been present since 1840, when the missionaries appear to have used the term, to encourage Mori chiefs to sign. The term was further developed at the Koham Kamarama meeting in Auckland. Over four weeks at Kohamrama, a wide range of Mori from outside those groups fighting the government discussed the treaty and their concerns over land. The Kohamrama Covenant proposed a native council and other ideas, some of which were embodied in the first Native Land Act two years later. The native council, however, was never set up. The government continued to face unremitting political pressure to provide land for waves of new migrants. 1862 M. Kamori Affairs shifts to government George Gray was appointed to New Zealand for a second term as governor, commencing in late 1861. Up to this point, native affairs had been the responsibility of the governor, because of concerns in England, that the elected settler governments would inevitably put their interests ahead of those of Mori. In 1862, however, the British government instructed Gray to accept the advice of his ministers in native affairs. However, as commander-in-chief of British forces in New Zealand, he retained a great deal of control, and responsibility for native affairs did not fully pass to the New Zealand government until 1865. In the light of the disastrous Watara purchase, and as part of its newfound responsibilities, the settler government and Gray together shaped the Native Land Act 1862, which set up the Native Land Court to adjudicate upon competing customary claims to land. It created a court of Mori chiefs chaired by a Pge magistrate. The act also allowed Mori to deal directly with settlers over land because it contravened the treaty, it had to be approved in London. Given the time this took, and the warfare taking place around the North Island, this act was hardly ever implemented before it was replaced by the very different 1865 Act.